How's it going, Twitch? My name is Skull, and on behalf of East Asia Soft, welcome to today's stream. Today is Sunday, which means that it's time for me to continue my playthrough of Seabed on Nintendo Switch. Uh, this is a visual novel, a eerie visual novel, and uh, it has gotten me very confused, but very intrigued. I want to see what's going on, if we could try and figure out how to unravel this mystery that we have on our hands. Hi, Buster, how you doing? Let's go ahead and load into our most recent save. <clears throat> so, I would bring you guys up to speed on what the premise is, but I'm very lost as to what the premise is myself. So I recommend you guys just head over to YouTube and watch the series from the beginning to get all caught up, as I'm sure a lot of people on YouTube afterwards watching this very stream are doing. Hello to all of you. Probably turn the music down even a little more. There we go. Okay. Takako opened the drawer and stopped moving. What are you doing? I felt nostalgic over there for a moment. Do you even know what that word means? There were some leftovers from the presents I received over the holidays. You still haven't eaten them all? Or rather, have you actually not had enough yet? Takako took out a few little bags from the drawer, then lined them up on the desk. Steamed buns from Sachi, rice crackers from Fumi, and some fried snacks from Inukai. You kept them? Yeah. I couldn't decide if I should eat them to keep myself awake during the morning. Have them for dessert after lunch. Or use them to get a quick energy boost in the evening. I also wasn't sure if I should use them to bolster my spirits on Monday. Endure until Wednesday. Or make them the grand prize for surviving until Friday. You see, some of those are salty, while others are sweet. So I was thinking I should use the salty ones to boost my motivation when I'm already feeling good. While I could use the sweet ones when I was more tired. Thing is, sweet things don't go so well with certain drinks, so I had to take that into consideration as well. <clears throat> well, I bet everyone's glad you gave their presents so much thought. Yeah, but then as I kept thinking and reconsidering, I eventually forgot I had them until opening this drawer right now. Takako placed her jaw on the desk, wistfully gazing at her treasures. We still have some comped compedo left. There were still a few sugary candies lying in the box. We're keeping them until after work. Whatever you say. Eventually, Takako chose the steamed bun to her right. She popped it into her mouth, her face remaining completely emotionless as she chewed. Yeah, I guess I shouldn't have wasted that much time. I think it might have expired. Takako picked up her teacup and took a big gulp. Yeah, expired bread. Ugh. Wonder what's up with Takako. Besides her being our spirit animal. As the sun began to set and the lights lit up in the darkening corridors, Takako switched on the office's fluorescent lamp. She then returned to her desk in silence. Takako, Fumi, and Inukai continued their work under the il illumination of the white light, almost like it was still in the middle of the day. The, compete the Compeito box lay empty on the table. Alrighty! Takako crossed her fingers and stretched her back. You got a day off tomorrow as well, right? Wanna go see a movie? Takako addressed Inukai and Fumi over their monitors. Are they showing anything good right now? How about that detective story? A Japanese film? You prefer Western movies? I can't take most Japanese films seriously. Most of their lines sound fake. But that's what's so good about them! Even the actors seem more interested in showing themselves off rather than playing their characters properly. That's cause you're not interested in them. 
Some people watch movies just because of the actors they like. Inukai's hand stopped as he got distracted by Takako's conversation again. Hi, Apresha Blem. How's it going? Oh, shoot. Nope. Never mind. Be gone, bot. <laughs> Thought that was an actual viewer. And then I read the message. I have some plans for tomorrow, so I can't go. Fumi made a quick response while arranging the things on her desk. Didn't you say you were free on the weekend? I did not. My friend from high school is getting married tomorrow. Come on! It's kind of rare for us all to get a day off at the same time. Can't you skip it? Takako placed her elbows on the desk and leaned closer to Fumi over the monitors. They asked me to sing. I can't just ruin their plans like that. Fumi leaned away from Takako. You can sing? Miss Fumi used to be in a band from what I've heard. Inukai joined the conversation. That's awesome! Are you actually producing original songs and stuff? We still have one of the CDs we released. Well, not like I'd ever bring it in here. What? That sounds like so much fun! Go make one yourself. It's not that hard. I can't think of any lyrics. You could just write down whatever. We'll take care of the music. Hey, I've never even kept a diary. Song lyrics might be a bit too much. Most people's creative writing experience begins and ends with emails, I suppose. Thank you very much. I am Takako. Does that sound good enough? Sure, why not? You can try and go for this ultra-polite band. All right! Let's make the name of our album Deathmatch and the title of our first song, Deviation! Does that sound good to you? All I have is a bad feeling about it. The grandfather clock in the corridor signaled the beginning of the new hour. Sorry, but I have to leave early. Fumi placed the belt of her handbag on her shoulder and stood up. Thanks for all the work today. See you next week. Inukai and myself said our farewells to Fumi as she headed toward the kitchen. You're going already? I'm visiting my parents tomorrow. I have to start preparing for that. Fumi told Takako the exact same information that was already written on the whiteboard behind her. I think I'll be leaving soon, too. Progress is as I have previously reported. Fumi put on her coat and left the office. Alright, thanks for all you did today. The sun had already set, making the temperature in the room drop a notch. I lifted my jacket off the hanger to dress myself in something a bit warmer. As I returned to my desk, Inukai stood up with his bag in hand. I'll be leaving early then. I glanced at the clock to find out it had been about an hour since Fumi left. See you next week! Both Takako and I ended up saying that at the same time. Inukai bowed his head and left the office. What do you think you'll finish? I addressed Takako as the footsteps in the corridor grew more distant. I'm done. You've already finished? I finished everything work-related hours ago. What were you doing then? Well, whatever. We need to do some shopping before going home. Again! Takago turned her chair around to face me. I saw that you people ate everything that was in the office fridge. I love the carpaccio you made. Ever thought of opening up a restaurant of your own? I mean, if you can whip up something that good from mere leftovers. Is there anything particular you want to eat tonight? Wait a sec. Takako spun her chair around and considered her monitor. I wrote a program that selects your dinner for you. What on earth are you doing during off during work hours? 
First, you need to enter your mood today, then your blood type, and finally, your birthday. Wouldn't my birthday alone be enough? Takako tapped the keyboard a few times and pushed the enter key. Her computer gave off a goofy sound effect and... Croquette! Huh. So, you want croquette for dinner? Hmm, I think I want something wider. Not in the mood for meat and potatoes either. Well, I guess I could go for curry, but we ate a lot of that last week, so I'd rather try something new. I kept listening to that goofy sound effect repeating over and over again. I see it only has things you like. I'd want a beef udon, but it's not coming up for some reason. Anyway, we're leaving. Get your things. Sure thing. I hope I haven't given her an annoying voice. Takako turned off her computer. I'll go turn off the lights outside. And with that, she left the office to take care of the lights out in the corridor. I locked the kitchen and the windows. <clears throat> the office door opened as I was pulling down the blinds. Hello. I turned around to see Inukai with a bag in his hands. What happened? Uh, oh, what happened? I forgot my keys. Inukai opened the top the top drawer of his desk, took out a bundle of keys from it, then placed it in his pants pocket. Did you decide on the movie you want to watch? A movie? Inukai locked his drawer as he replied. Are you busy tomorrow? Not really. I see. Are you leaving? Or are you leaving? Inukai asked me a question as I was confirming the calendar. Yes, I was just about to right now. That's good. I'm glad you made it. I guess. Do you want me to turn off the lights? Inukai reached out to the light switch near the entrance. Thank you. I guess this is in the future. I looked around the dark office, but spotted no lights from any running machinery I might have missed. I picked up my bag and keys before continuing toward the main corridor. Have you seen Takako outside? Inukai furrowed his brows. Takako? I'm sorry, but... I'm not sure I know who that is. Did somebody order a pile of bricks? What? <laughs> Excuse me? I took a different route home this time, deciding to enter a small and rather lonely-looking bar. The place first piqued my interest about six months ago, but I had since forgotten all about it. There was a simple rectangle-shaped liquor shelf behind the illuminated counter. The interior was dimly lit. I could barely make out the faces of people sitting just two seats from me. Excuse me. Did I make you wait? I heard a voice from behind just as I finished ordering my highball. Narasaki sat down next to me. Hello. Hey, this seems like a nice place. You come here a lot? No, it's actually my first time here. Is that a highball? I guess I'll try out the same. I nodded and Narasaki ordered the exact same drink I did. Do you drink a lot? Hmm, only at parties, or if I'm feeling really tired. Hmm. A glass identical to mine was placed in front of Nadasaki. You're pretty early. You're pretty early. Didn't you say you were busy lately? I canceled one of our commissions. Ah, I see. It was something Takako was supposed to do. Was she the only one capable of doing it or something? Yes. Hmm. Takako has been quite odd since we were kids, right? 
Yeah, she sure had plenty of energy to spare. I'll give her that. Okay, so we can establish Takako is not a figment of Sachi's imagination. I don't think. Yes, she possesses a unique kind of sensitivity. No, I guess that's putting it too nicely. You could say she's always looking at things from a different perspective compared to others. Well, she's pretty eccentric is what I'm trying to say. Eccentric. Narasaki parroted me. I could tell there was something off about her back in elementary school during our first art class. You know how palettes have separate holes for primary colors? Well, she would first mix all of them together, then use the almost randomly derived set of colors from that mess. Hmm. <clears throat> I would always use only the colors I needed. For example, if we had to color leaves, I'd choose green, yellow, orange, and perhaps some red to mix with them. But before long, Takako would always be ahead of me. Our grades were pretty much the same, but the teacher would always pay more attention to her. On top of that, whenever we submitted our works for a competition, I always end up qualifying at best while she kept winning prizes. There was a time I almost started hating her for it. Did her work look good from your perspective too? Well, I don't think I could really call her extraordinarily good, but her works always have something that catches your eye. Something. Yes. I didn't even realize that I'd already finished my glass. Narasaki's glass was empty too. She ordered another cocktail. Do you know a lot about these kinds of drinks? Not really. I just remembered an elderly man who kept coming to our place. He'd always mention this one. The bartender put some ice in the glass and stirred it with a bar spoon, cooling it off. He then did away with the water that came with melted ice and split some of the alcohol Narasaki ordered into a measuring cup. It was some sort of foreign liquor I couldn't recognize from the label alone, but its golden hue reminded me of whiskey. He stirred it with a bar spoon again and picked up on the soda next. After pouring most of it in one go, he carefully added the final few drops. The ice cubes jostled about in the drink as the bartender stirred it, sending bubbles floating to the surface. It almost looked like some sort of chemistry experiment. He then added a bit more of the alcohol to make the drink gain some color. As it took off on a vivid golden hue, the bartender plugged the bottle with a confident air of perfection about him. And that made you insecure? Natasaki took her glass, continuing our conversation. Yes, I suppose so. I see. I ordered another drink myself. I think you don't need to worry about your work. I'm not an expert on arts and design or anything, but you should be fine. Why would you say that? Much like Takako had her own skills, you're also capable of things others can't imitate. Oh? And what would those be? Hmm. I'm not sure how to put it, but I guess one could say you're able to comprehend things at their base level. Am I? Even if supposing you're right, what use would a skill like that be? With enough effort, you could accomplish the same things as Takako. You think? After all, you're one tough gal. Few things in the world could phase you. With that, I can agree. Ha <laughs> ha! I see. Narasaki chuckled. I think I'll try visiting your clinic this week. What day would be okay? Do you have any preferences? I ordered my third drink. I've got no appointments on Wednesday so far. And I'll drop by sometime before lunch. Alright. After that, we discussed our past for a while. About the time we spent together at the kindergarten, and what we'd both done since we parted ways. Nadasaki kept jotting down some of the things I said. When I asked her about it, she said it contained hints for my diagnosis. So, so, so Takako is not a figment of Sachi's imagination because Narasaki remembers her as well. I'm curious. So why did Inukai not? I opened my eyes to see a sideway view of my room and a rectangle-shaped analog alarm clock. A white dog with lop ears was pointing at it a few minutes before seven. 
I push the yellow button on the clock to stop the alarm from ringing. With my left eye still somewhat misty from being pushed against the pillow, I climbed out of bed and lifted the black uniform off the hanger. I sported a, it sported a fairly dull design with only its dark red scarf standing out. I'm leaving. With that, I opened the main door. As I stepped outside, I spotted Takako waving at me near the gate, still wearing her summer uniform. Morning! Morning. I walked down the stone steps to the gate. As I looked closer, I realized that the knot of Takako's scarf was slightly crooked to the right, and her bag, which should have contained the same books as mine, looked oddly thick and heavy. You're quite early today. The weather was so nice, it would have been a waste to sleep in. I see. That's one thing that I could never do, just wake up early to enjoy the weather. Nope, I'll sleep through the whole day if it means getting a good night's rest. Takako lined up next to me as I exited the gate and continued down the road. This uniform's cute. Well, they say that rising early benefits you three mon. Hmm. How much Yen is a mon? Takako looked at me. I don't know. I wonder how much it is. I've read in the book that 4,000 mon is one Ryu. If you rise early 1,334 times, it'll amount to one Ryu. One Ryu? That sounds rich! It does? Ooh, kitty! As we passed the Ryo Ryokuchi, Ryokuchi Park and reached the main road while chatting about late night music programs on TV and the, mus and the movies we'd seen recently, we could finally see the school building just beyond the railroad crossing. I'm going to take a picture of that, save it for my wife. We have a class representative meeting today, so you can leave without me. I passed the tracks while telling that to Takako. Got it! Takako gave a curt answer. A few minutes after the bell signaled the end of the school day, countless students filled the previously empty corridors. You have a class representative meeting after this, right? Yes. In that case, we'll be going home ahead of you. See you tomorrow. My classmates left the classroom. What are you doing? What are you doing? I addressed Takako as she was taking her sweet time to clear her desk, awkwardly lagging behind even after everyone else had left. Got some time today, Sachi? Didn't I tell you about the class representative meeting? Oh, okay. With that, Takako picked up her bag and staggered out of the classroom. After giving the clock above the blackboard a quick glance, I pulled out my English textbook and some notes from my bag. I placed them on the desk and after turning to the page with the material covered in class that day, began translating one of the longer passages. Oh man, that sounds like a lot of homework. Tick, tick, tick. The clock above the blackboard kept ticking away. As I finished my review and turned the page to start preparing for tomorrow's class, the classroom's door opened. Our, our homeroom teacher, wearing a blue suit and sporting a short haircut, looked in my direction. You're the last one, right, Mizuno? Don't forget to lock the windows when you leave. Okay. Our homeroom teacher closed the door and continued down the corridor, his low heels clicking against the hard surface of the floor. Once he had descended the stairs and could no longer be heard, I began hearing the ticking of the clock again. I closed the windows and locked them. As I picked up my bag and was about to leave, I noticed a blue bucket filled with water in the corner of the classroom. I turned to the small blackboard that was normally used for communication and saw the cleaning duty list written on it. Takako's name was next to today's date. Not again. I sighed in the empty classroom. Oh, that just continued. Picked up the bucket and continued to the corridor where I unloaded it into the sink. I picked up the dust cloth that was hung on the bucket and drenched it in tap water. 
After rubbing its dirty sides against each other, I squeezed the water out of it. Seeing how it was winter, the water itself felt cold as fresh snow, making me wince. I'll have to talk to her about this. Takako was wearing her summer uniform. I remembered how Takako awkwardly staggered out of the classroom. I returned to the classroom and placed the dust cloth back into the cleaning tool locker. I glanced at the classroom clock again, and after hurriedly stuffing my writing utensils into my bag, continued to school building number four, where the third year classrooms were. As I descended the stairs, I ran into Takako at the exit of the school, of the school building. Is this a shoe rack? I think this is a shoe rack. She was looking at her shoe locker with her arms crossed. After a few seconds, she reached out and slowly opened it. The next moment, her shoulders slumped. If utter disappointment had its own sound effect, I would have heard it just now. That's right. Today was your birthday. Hearing my voice made her turn toward me. Sachi! Her lips curled into a happy smile. I'm sorry, but I've got nothing for you this year. No way! It took only a second for her smile to turn into an expression of despair. Hmm. Come here. I walked closer, seized her arm, and continued toward the exit. Where are we going? I'll give you something good. We circled around the building and reached the desolate area behind it. What's this something? I looked around, briefly surveying the place. Okay. I took a step closer to Takako. This made Takako jump a bit, after which she timidly closed her eyes. That's not what I brought you here for. I tapped her forehead with my palm and pointed at the ground below. <laughs> okay. You can have this. Takako looks down. Wow, her hair's a lot shorter here. Huh? What? Look! It's a four leaf clover I found earlier. Eh? Takako let out a beastly owl as she fell to her knees to inspect the clover. Uh, but you can't pluck it, okay? Another howl reverberated across the yard as I stopped her. <laughs> That's not why I brought you here. <laughs> That's funny. Fun music. Oh, we're in we're in the office now. Okay. Is that where the name of your office comes from? Or Oh, okay, this is her talking. Is that where the name of your office comes from? Sounds pretty trite, doesn't it? I like it. It rolls off the tongue pretty well, too. Narasaki, sitting on her chair in the clinic, kept taking notes as I talked. I absentmindedly regarded her right hand as it kept scribbling something on the paper, even after I had finished my story. Her speed was pretty incredible, yet her handwriting was meticulously clean and followed perfectly straight lines. Well, she failed as a doctor. On top of that, she glanced at the business card she held in her left hand. Her right, meanwhile, kept on going at an unchanged pace. There was a period during middle school when we temporarily drifted apart, but soon enough we started talking on a daily basis again. I think that memory turned into something special for Takako. I see, said Narasaki as she flipped my business card around to have a look at its other side. Why did you want it anyway? I just wanted to see it. Mm, that's some pretty high quality paper you're using there. The drawing of the clover looks really cute too. Our job is designing things like this. It would affect our business if our cards had ugly drawings on them. I see. I guess it's like the sign of a sign maker shop. Mostly pretty old ones, though. 
Narasaki left my business card on the empty space between the scattered papers and medical records before fixing its position with her index and middle fingers. She then placed her index finger on the card. I could hear the faint sound of rain from the little window behind her. As I entered Narasaki's office, I saw a desk for medical examinations, two chairs, a hospital bed, and a medicine cabinet. There were many medical books of all sorts of bottles on, on her relatively small shelf, seemingly in complete disarray. Yet oddly enough, they didn't give off a sense of untidiness at all. Perhaps there was a secret order to them all. Can you remember exactly when all this happened? During my first year in high school, I think. Narasaki wrote down Takiko's birthday and placed the pin on her desk. She then turned around and let me know that it was time to start the actual examination. You don't suppose that Takako is a figment and Narasaki is just playing along. Ah, oh, man. This game is having me guess a lot. Let me hear your symptoms first. Don't be afraid to tell me anything and try to be as specific as possible. I told her everything I was aware of. First, I told her about the ringing in my ears. Although I had already said most of what there was to say in the cafe. Although I will point out, the game starts from Takako's perspective. We haven't seen that since the intro, the prologue, whatever it was called. We haven't seen that at all since then, not even once. So, but we have seen it. So I don't think she's not real. I don't know. After that, I told her about the hallucinations. I'd never given her any concrete examples before, so this time I went into as much detail as possible when describing how I interacted with Takako at home or at the office. Narasaki kept taking notes in her medical chart as I spoke. As I kept recalling things on the fly, I occasionally had to stop and think about whether a given event took place before or after Takako had disappeared from the real world. Did that really happen after Takako disappeared? Narasaki seemed to have noticed as well and made sure to question me about it. I answered honestly, saying I wasn't quite certain. But then I told her about how I found out that Inukai had never actually met Takako. Narasaki nodded and after a short pause gave me a serious look. So you're saying that this junior employee, Inukai, told you he's never met her? Yes, but I can remember seeing them working together. In other words, one of you is wrong. Narasaki cocked her head to the side while crossing her arms and legs. She almost looked like the statue of the thinker. It didn't look like he was lying to me. When did you join your company exactly? I got curious about that too and looked it up. I pulled out a copy of his resume from the bag I'd left in the basket and handed it to Narasaki. <clears throat> hmm. It says almost two years ago. The date on the resume was the start of the previous year, so it made sense to assume he started coming to the office within the following year. I waited for her next words. According to your memories, Takako disappeared last year, right? Yes. Hmm. In any case, I asked her other employee about it, and she remembered Takako. Fumi has been working with us since we established the place. I see. And it's been four years since then, right? Now that is interesting. That is very interesting. Which makes it... Narasaki moved the books from the table, pulled out a brown printer paper from the drawer, and drew an axis of time on it. Hmm. If your junior employee is correct, then Takako disappeared sometime during this period. Narasaki pointed at the line marking four to two years ago. If you are correct, then she disappeared sometime during this period. Next, she pointed at the period of time from two years ago all the way to the present day. We have to figure this out first. I felt like my thoughts would grow sluggish whenever I tried to think about it. Can you remember exactly when it happened from your perspective? Yes, it was last autumn. I almost felt like I had been swimming in a pool when the water suddenly turned into mud. My thoughts simply wouldn't progress from A to B. 
We went on a trip like we always do. She suddenly disappeared in the middle of it. I managed to force that out, at least. If you're not feeling well, you don't need to overdo it. But can you try remembering any details about her disappearance? Is this the trip they took to Fiji? I tried to recall our trip. We were walking down a stove pavement, surrounded by buildings made from red brick. Well, this was not Fiji. This might have been Rome. Takako was saying something, with her gaze fixed on the pamphlet map. But it was as though she was somewhere far away, and I couldn't make out her voice at all. The scenery itself began to distort, and eventually dispersed. Ing okay? Sachi? I heard Narasaki's voice. Do you feel sick? No, I'm, I'm okay. It's like a part of my memory is covered by fog. I can't recall a thing. I see. But why? Why would I forget something that important? Was it traumatic? I'm just going to do a quick aside here. Traumatic memories, you do forget. Your brain, it, it's a coping mechanism. It's a survival mechanism. No matter how close someone is to you, if something traumatic happens to them, you're just going to forget it sometimes. And I wonder if that's what happened here. Sometimes you forget things precisely because they're important. Narasaki considered me for a few long moments, then turned back to her desk and began filling out her medical chart. Is there anything else you'd like to tell me? I think this is all. You haven't told me about the ringing in your ears as of late. Did it stop? Narasaki asked me about my anxiety-induced acoustic hyper hyperesthesia. Hi anxiety-induced acoustic hyperesthesia. Wow. It hasn't been happening lately. You are sure about that? Narasaki gave me a scrutinizing look. Uh, it didn't completely go away. It still happens with roughly the same frequency, but now it seems like it's ringing somewhere far away. I no longer get the feeling that my eardrums are going to burst like I used to. Narasaki inhaled a deep breath and responded with a quick, I see, exhaling it. After that, she began silently spinning her pen between her fingers, so I decided to ask if there was anything she had learned from our conversation. I can make a few educated guesses, but I can't tell anything for sure until I examine you. What do you mean? I need to verify whether your symptoms are caused by physical or psychological factors. She told me that physical factors are usually described as endogenous and psychological ones as psycho psychogenic. So you need to separate them, I see. Exactly. Let me go into a bit more detail. There are multiple things that can be the cause for hallucinations, ringing in the ears and dis... dis... Mm, this me dysnesia wow whatever that is such as drugs brain damage or schizophrenia the treatment for any of these differs completely so i first need to elucidate the cause i see i think i got it i nodded to which Nadasaki responded with a nod of her own in that case i'd like to go into a bit more detail do you still have time today i checked my watch and said that i did and I'll try to investigate the timing of Takako's disappearance on my end as well. Good. Okay, Takako's real. We can establish that for sure. For sure, for sure, for sure. Precious Bun lives! Or at the very least, did. Nadasaki took out a stethoscope from one of her drawers and used it to inspect my body for any unusual sounds. Are you getting enough sleep every night? I make sure to sleep at least six hours a night no matter how busy I am. I only had to take off my shirt, but it was kind of embarrassing to be seen like this by an actual acquaintance. It's a doctor. It's fine. You don't drink periodically, do you? I only ever drink at social gatherings. Have you been to any doctors for other conditions recently? Not that I can think of. For sure, for sure. That's a good sign, Buster. I'll take it. I will find this straw and grasp it for dear life. 
Hmm. You can put your shirt back on. Narasaki put the stethoscope away. After that, she made me take a written test. It was really easy. I had to do simple addition, write down today's date, and draw geometrical forms that were given to me, among other things. As I finished the test with little hassle, Nadasaki asked me if I wanted to take a blood test just in case. A blood test? You're gonna draw blood from me? Seeing how I wasn't as scared as needles as Takako, I agreed to the blood test, hoping it might help. Don't worry, I won't be able to read your memories from this or anything, said Narasaki with a smile as she drew my blood. If it helps solve this, I would in mind. The procedure came to an end as I was trying to look away. Been there. Rather than pain, what I felt was more akin to my veins being lightly prodded by a finger. Hmm. It appeared that Narasaki was good at drawing blood. After discarding the needle, she placed my blood with a... She placed my blood on a silver rack. I made a brief sigh, prompting Narasaki to ask me if anything was wrong. I was seeing hallucinations, hearing sounds, and to top it all off, I apparently had memory problems as well. If that wasn't enough to get one depressed, I didn't know what was. Uh, I was just thinking about how my mind wasn't as strong as I thought it was. Narasaki made one of her usual, unique chuckles, exhaling the air in a single breath. What's so funny? I gave her an indignant look. You don't look that distraught, that's all. What makes you say that? I mean, if a sigh is the extent of your reaction. Oh, other way around. I mean, if a sigh is the extent of your reaction... I might not be good at conveying it, but I am genuinely worried, okay? Shows that you're still feeling fine enough to maintain a calm exterior. On top of that, you're trying to face this problem with a cool head. Most mental patients aren't that aware of their problems and only end up visiting a professional due to peer pressure. Compared to that, you not only recognize that something is off with what you're experiencing, but are trying to figure it out yourself through intellectual reasoning. In short, you're both tough and possess an open and flexible mind. Can't say that makes me feel any better. Well, you being this self-aware makes my job a lot easier, at least. Narasaki added with a smile. I hope you're treating this seriously. You shouldn't overthink things like this. I gave her a serious look, but she responded with her usual laid-back expression, as if nothing of importance had happened. I could see a rectangular patch of light on her shoulder that filtered in through the small window behind her. Noticing my gaze, Nadasaki glanced at the window herself. The sound of rain abated, and now the faint window-shaped patch of light extended across the floor. Well, we finished the blood test and all, so I guess we might as well have a sip of some coffee. Nadasaki stood up and left the consultation room. As I killed time absentmindedly, gazing at the pictures stuck to the corkboard on her desk, Narasaki returned with two cups of coffee in hand. She placed one in front of me and kept the other in her hands as she sat down. With her left hand freed, she put it in the pocket of her white coat, while using the right to take a sip from her cup. I reached out to my cup as well. Did that help you calm down a little? Narasaki posed that question to me just as I finished about half my coffee. A little. I don't think we saw much of anything yet, though. With these kinds of problems, just confiding in someone can help a lot. One's frame of mind is one's frame of mind is all that matters, she added. I had to admit, it made me feel better that she was acting so confident. I suppose I do feel a little less stressed now. Nadasaki grinned. What are we going to do from now on? Well, for starters, I heard you out. Now I'll have to look through the results of your examination to be able to tell what exactly is going on and what the causes are. Then I can come up with the best solution for you. She would make it clear what the problem was before tackling it head on. I'll take care of all the complicated stuff, so you should just relax and give me some time. All right. As I've told you, if you come here, I'll see this thing through to the end, or at least until you're satisfied. 
Okay. Don't worry about it too much for now. As our appointment drew to a close, Narasaki told me that this was just a preliminary check. <clears throat> After deciding on the time of my next visit and indulging in some small talk, I left the clinic. So what is going on with Takako? I bet something happened to her and it was traumatic and that's been scattering Sachi's memories. Maybe I shouldn't bet that because, God, this game is making me guess so much. That's that's my leading theory right now is that something happened during that trip to Takako and Sachi, it forced Sachi to forget all about it. <clears throat> anyway. <clears throat> the sun shone brightly in the sky as I left the clinic. I wouldn't have been surprised to see a rainbow as well. I didn't dislike the smell of wet asphalt. I looked at the taxi parked in front of the pharmacy, but quickly averted my gaze before the driver could make eye contact. Another taxi drove to the clinic. I wasn't really knowledgeable about this area, but I felt that my office shouldn't have been that far from it. After thinking for a few minutes, I decided to go on foot. As I expected, after moving north a few blocks, I found myself on a familiar street. Relieved, I continued walking, thinking back to my conversation with Narasaki. Hallucinations, ringing in the ears, whatever that word is, did sound pretty depressing. Dis... Dysne... Dysnesia? I gotta figure out how to... Dysnesia. Well, the definition is an impairment of memory. I wish I could hear somebody pronounce it for me. Ugh. However, as Narasaki said, I didn't feel that anxious or confused about it. At least you're self-aware. I recalled what she told me. I'd say it's pretty important to get the full picture. I realized I had walked into a shadow. Raising my face, I stopped just a moment before bumping into a street sign. The last time I actually hit a street sign with my face was still in elementary school. Takako, however, kept telling me how it was a bad habit of mine to completely lose sight of my surroundings when I had something on my mind. I realized I was standing in front of a library. I checked my wristwatch. I still had some time before work. Psychology was in a different section for medicine, so it was a pain to find it. However, before I could spot an idling library worker, I found myself in front of a shelf with these kinds of books. I randomly picked one up and opened it. This music is interesting. It seemed to be a dictionary dealing with terms of clinical psychology. I read through a few random pages until my eyes stopped on something. Catharsis, a method of treatment that makes repressed memories resurface in order to avoid an explosive buildup. Making repressed memories resurface. According to the definition I was aware of, the word referred to the purification of emotions. However, in the context of psychology, it also seemed related to what Narasaki was talking about, understanding the whole picture. I closed the book and considered the shelf again. In the end, I chose two books and brought them to the counter. As I left the psychology section, I stopped, wondering if I should perhaps borrow some other books, mostly for recreational reading. The librarian behind the counter noticed me lingering about. Over here, please. The librarian was a woman of short stature whose head barely reached up to my shoulders. I checked the floor behind the counter. It was the same height as the floor on my side. Do you happen to have a membership card? She addressed me with a slightly high-pitched tone. No. Is this your first time visiting? Yes. I'll prepare a card for you then. Can you fill out this form here? She placed a piece of paper and a pen in front of me. I wrote down my name and contact information. How long will this take? I handed her the form and glanced at the clock on the counter. Just a few minutes. Her reply was quick and curt. <clears throat> I wish she was more specific, but I nodded and decided to wait. I placed three books on the counter and the librarian scanned their covers with a barcode reader. I heard three beeps. She picked up the card that came out of a machine beyond the counter, gave it a final check, then handed it to me. Here you go, your library card. 
really didn't take long. I picked it up along with my three books. Didn't she only get two? The sun was starting to set as I left the library. This time I headed straight for the office, but it was a slightly farther than I expected. I ended up arriving late. Interesting. I wonder what the... I wonder what the significance of the library is. The hour arm of the clock above the entrance was pointing at the number five when I finally reached the office building. As I began ascending the stairs, I heard the footsteps of someone coming down. Oh, Inukai. Hello. On your way home? Hello. I'm leaving on time today. What about Fumi? She's still in the office. She said she wanted to talk to you about something. I see. I'll be going then. Alright, see you tomorrow. I reached the floor where our office was located, continued down the corridor, and stopped in front of the door. As if jolted by static electricity, my hand suddenly stopped right before touching the doorknob. But I simply shook my head and stepped inside. I'm back! Oh, hey there! Fumi replied right away. I turned toward the direction of her voice and saw her busily writing something at her desk. There was no one else in the office. Fumi was the only one present. I walked to the whiteboard, turned my magnet upside down, and erased the brief note detailing the reason for my absence. Oh? It says here that Inukai is still in the office. He forgot his magnet again. I'll have a chat with him tomorrow. I turned Inukai's magnet upside down. According to this, Fumi and I were in the office while Inukai and Anne were gone. As I returned to my desk, I spotted some papers and my document tray. Ah, oh, I've taken care of the receipt applications, so I left the bills in your tray. I see. Thanks. I turned on my PC, prompting lines of letters to appear on the black background of the monitor. I stood up and looked through the rest of the papers as my machine booted up. A few drafts of the commissions I placed in the tray myself, attendance records, and year-end vacation applications. Does the schedule work for you? They had extra days off at the end of the year, but fewer days at the beginning. We had fewer offers next year, so I had to agree to some extra challenging jobs. Ah, yes. No problems on my end. Fumi straightened her back as she turned around to answer. I mean, all that's changed since our vacation starts earlier. You, you visit your family home during the holidays, right? I imagine you might not be able to meet everyone if vacation times keep shifting. I don't have anyone special that I'd be dying to meet anyway. Don't make me say it out loud, jeez. She then changed the topic by complaining about how cold it was in the office. <clears throat> I'm sorry. If you can finish your current commission early, you're free to start your vacation right then. Hi, that sounds like an awfully attractive proposal. The opposite holds true as well, though. Ah, should have known. I'll do my best. I copied the important parts from the papers into my computer once it fin finished booting up. I opened the schedule file and entered Fumi's and Inukai's schedules. <laughs> hmm. Our vacation is unusually long this year, isn't it? I continued tapping away on the keyboard. We should take another trip together! I prefer a place that's warm this time of year. What about the Mediterranean Sea? I missed my chance to swim in it last time. I heard you can't swim in it past October. Then we should go to the tropical island again! As I recalled that starlit tropical sky in my mind's eye, another voice from up close interrupted my thoughts. Um, Miss Sachiko? What? I was startled but didn't jump, instead continued with fake calmness. Is something the matter? You seem to be talking to yourself there. It's nothing. Pay no mind. Okay, then. She brought me some tea. 
Thanks. If you don't have anything else for me, I'll leave by 7 tonight. Alright, go ahead. Fumi returned the tea tray to the kitchen and focused on her work. Um, would you like to have dinner together? Fumi addressed me. Sounds lovely, but I can't. There's something I need to finish. I see. Let's go some other time. Sure thing. Fumi left the office at 7 like she had said, and after killing some time so we wouldn't run into each other, I followed suit. Hmm. What is with these hallucinations of Takako? Two days later, I ended up finishing my work early, so I told Fumi and the others that I had a little errand to run and ran and went straight to the clinic. Upon telling Nadasaki about it, she asked me if everything was okay with work, adding that it must be a hassle to jump through all those hoops. I can't exactly tell everyone that I'm leaving early because I suspect I'm going mad and need to have my head checked. While I understand your circumstances, it's pretty common in this field. I'd also prefer to keep this from my regular clients. Have I not told you before? That's why I wanted to discuss this with you in private. Really? I looked at Nadasaki's desk. It had a bundle of medical records on it. Beyond that, on the wall, I spotted a green board with some memos, a couple of landscape pictures, and a small calendar pinned to it. The calendar had a picture of a turbulent-looking sea on it. It seemed dangerous to swim in. The entire scenery was dominated by the color blue. Even the cliffs in the distance seemed somewhat affected, resembling massive icebergs. The days below the picture were circled. They had all sorts of errands and what were most likely appointments written around them. Did you find something interesting? Or did you find something interesting? Nadasaki addressed me while jotting down something in my medical record. Yeah, I was wondering. How long have you been working here? I'm approaching my third year as a practicing physician. Before that, I worked at a different clinic. I considered her white coat, trying to imagine her usual day here. Which one of your past patients left the biggest impression? Nadasaki seemed to freeze for a moment. She then answered that there were many seemingly trying to avoid the subject. Realizing that it was probably a thoughtless question, I decided not to prod further. I shifted my gaze from Nadasaki and looked around the consultation room. All kinds of bottles with English labels lined the medicine shelf, neatly locked behind its glass door. As I absentmindedly gazed at the grated breaker, I realized that it went out of focus, with all the little blue lines on it blurring together. I rubbed my right eye. You seem tired. I pulled a late shift yesterday. I returned my gaze to Nadasaki. She slightly turned her chair toward me. Are you getting enough sleep lately? Work's a bit frantic these days. I'm handling twice my usual workload. That's not good. I know. The brunt of the work is already finished. All that's left is to organize everything. So you're saying the worst part is already over? Yes. Well, be careful. A vacation does little good if you only end up ruining your health through overworking. I know that. Do you have any plans to go somewhere? Not really. I see. Nadasaki took a breath and spun her pin around the thumb of her right hand. I felt as though I heard a cat meowing in the distance. I strained my ears only to hear another clear meow from the direction of the small window. I imagine it's walking along the fence behind the I imagine it's walking along the fence behind the building. I see them there sometimes. Nadasaki fell silent as I stared at the window. We remained completely silent, but no other meows followed. The window itself was similar to the kind that tends to be in bathrooms. When I thought about it, this room suddenly started feeling very small. You usually have people in this room that tend to say, 
some off-kilter things, right? Right? Nadasaki looked behind her, allowing her gaze to travel across the entire room before it finally stopped on me again. It's pretty small, isn't it? Lately, I've heard how other doctors try to make their consultation rooms look as spacious as possible and use brightly colored wallpapers to lessen the stress of the patients. It doesn't seem like you're doing that. I don't have the funds. Besides, this place is small, but it feels kind of isolated from the rest of the building, right? I feel it might help some patients to relax and talk instead. I think I like it this way, too. Glad to hear that. Narasaki made a satisfied smile. Did you take those pictures? No, I just stuck a bunch of photos. Did you take those pictures? No, I just stuck on a bunch of photos I liked. That's the blue grotto. Oh? I didn't even know that. You seem well informed. I've been to it. We went all sorts of places with Takako. Such as? That seemed to pique Narasaki's interest. felt more like I was chatting with a friend at a cafe rather than having an actual medical examination or anything of the sort. Nadasaki kept asking questions about my past, from my club activities, to school, to all the trips I had taken over the years. I told her everything I could remember, trying to be as brief and on point as possible. Nadasaki wrote everything down, her white coat swaying as her hand danced across the pages of the white paper. She would also jot down some notes to my medical record once in a while. When I told Nadasaki about how Takako found a printing error on a winning candy stick and the woman selling them had to fix it with a marker, she once again added a note to my medical record. After heaving a brief sigh, I took a sip of coffee to have a break from all the talking. Any new problems since our last appointment? <clears throat> I told her about how I saw Takako at the office after discussing vacation plans with Fumi. Nadasaki wrote something down in my medical record again. Squeezed under it, I saw a medical examination paper with all sorts of numbers printed out on it. It looked like it could have been my blood test. Aren't those the results of my previous examination? Nadasaki followed my gaze and spotting the paper gave me a nod. Did you find anything out? I wanted to know if she had come any closer to elucidating the cause. <clears throat> of course I did. <clears throat> Nadasaki pulled the paper out and placed it on top of the medical record. For starters, it doesn't seem like her condition is physical. She explained, tracing the top line of the results with her finger. According to our tests, your physical health is in perfect order. All your blood values are normal, and we found no drugs in your system. According to the written test you took, it doesn't seem like your intellect is impaired in any way either. And finally, from your reactions to my questions during our conversations, I'd say schizophrenia can also be safely rolled out. Then what's causing this? It's most likely something psychogenic. I guess something along the lines of a strong mental trauma, or chronic stress. Or perhaps both, she added. I tried to consider both possibilities. I was busy with work, but I didn't have any severe problems. If anything, my company was on the rise. My personal life had grown quite lonely without Takako, but it wasn't to the extent that I lost sleep thinking about it. I also couldn't think of any particularly stressful or shocking situations I might have been exposed to. Not in my private life, and not at work either. Any ideas? Nadasaki asked. I kept thinking for a few more moments, then answered in the negative. Nadasaki nodded and leaned against her chair. Is something the matter? I imagine it's most likely that you've forgotten the cause. I'm not trying to sound like I know everything about you, but from what you've told me so far, I can't think of a more likely cause than Takako's disappearance. Besides, you told me you couldn't recall the details surrounding it. So, both the ringing in my ears and hallucinations are caused by that? I'm not sure about the ringing, but it would be natural to assume that your hallucinations of Takako are. I've already thought of that possibility. 
Takako's disappearance left a deep wound in my heart, and I was chronically exhausted from trying to manage my life and work without her. But I've never faced that pain. Instead, I made up another Takako in my mind to distract myself from it. Seems like you were thinking something along those lines yourself. Indeed I was. It was natural for her to assume the same. Still, I wasn't sure why, but I felt that something was off about that train of thought. As I fell silent, Nadasaki parted her lips and uttered the brief phrase, Everything has a reason or a cause, seemingly muttering to herself. I glanced at the medical record in Nadasaki's hands. It had a cause and symptoms written down on some sort of diagram looking thing. You still can't remember anything about how she disappeared? No. To tell the truth, I tried investigating reports about people who disappeared abroad over the past two years, but I couldn't find a single article on your friend. You mean... She hasn't disappeared? I don't know. Maybe there was simply no article written. Narasaki paused. I tried remembering my last trip at Takako, but my memories remained shrouded by a thick fog. I could try bringing those memories to the surface through hypnotherapy. Hypnotherapy? You mean hypnosis, like with the swaying coin and everything? Yeah, I can use a coin if you insist. Nadasaki pulled out one of her drawers open and picked up a 5 yen coin from all the chains scattered on the pen tray inside it. You can do that? The effectiveness varies drastically from person to person, but I've done hypnotherapy before. If Takako's disappearance really is the cause of your hallucinations, we might get a hint that could help with your recovery, provided you remember how it all happened. As I stared at the sizable coin on the desk, Nadasaki placed her hand on it. But first, I'd like to confirm that you actually want to get rid of the hallucinations. As I gave Nadasaki a puzzled look, she explained that my symptoms were slightly different from all the other patients she had dealt with. What's so different about me? The difference is that your symptoms don't seem to affect your life in any negative way, at least as far as I can tell. What do you mean? What do you think are the main problems with hallucinations? I cocked my head to the side. For example, let's say a patient keeps seeing bugs crawling on the walls or crazed killers chasing them through the streets. That causes them to get startled or even start running even when nothing is really happening. If that keeps happening periodically, well, you can imagine how it might become difficult to lead a normal life. That's what I mean by negative effects. However, in your case, it sounds like you've spent at least two years leading an ordinary life despite your condition. That's true. Also, not only did you not realize there was something wrong with you for two years, but neither did your acquaintances. I don't believe a massive difference in perception, such as seeing a person who's not there, could go unnoticed for long. As I've explained, hallucinations are false information interpreted by your brain as genuine. When you're looking at Takako, your eyes should be fixed on an empty space. When you hear her speak, you react to sounds that aren't there. Do you think no one would have noticed that for two whole years? Especially when you actually have conversations with her. She had a point. Now that I thought about it, my two colleagues seemingly showed no signs of finding anything wrong with my behavior. Nagasaki regarded me in silence. <clears throat> I realized that Narasaki had not seen me act that way either. And according to her, there were no physical factors that could have caused me to act this way either. From her perspective, it might even be plausible that I was making all this up. I'm not lying. I know that. I know you. You're not the kind to make up things like that. Narasaki's expression turned somewhat more mellow. Well, I suppose it's possible you simply never had any conversations with Takako when the other two were present. That can't be true. I have memories of all four of us talking. I may have been having conversations with her, but they certainly but they certainly couldn't have. In that case, perhaps you act normally when you're in front of them, the way you would if you understood that Takako was gone. I don't know. 
Are you saying my memories are incorrect? Most likely. In your head, there's a delusion that Takako is still with you, and it keeps overriding your real memories. Hmm. I considered Nadasaki's words for a while, with my gaze fixed on the floor. Soon enough, I heard her chair creak, which made me raise my face again. So, let me repeat myself. Are you sure you want to get rid of those hallucinations, even though they don't seem to interfere with your normal life? She continued without waiting for my answer. For example, there are people with alleged psychic powers that can see ghosts and auras around people. From the perspective of psychiatry, that's a condition that should be looked at, but from their perspective, it's not something they necessarily want to be cured of. That's because neither of those cause severe problems during their normal lives. In a way, your situation is similar. Inside you, there seem to exist both the office without Takako that you share with your colleagues and an alternate one with her that you keep to yourself. Besides, I couldn't find anything psych physically wrong with you either, so there's also the possibility this might go away on its own eventually. I felt like making a sigh, but I held it in. Still, if there's anything... Still, if there's anything that can cure me, I want to try it. I'd rather not want to worry about suddenly starting to talk about things that don't make sense to my colleagues and seeing things that no one else does kind of weirds me out. Nadasaki broke our gaze as she fell in thought for a few moments and looked back at me. Over that time, the pen in her right hand moved from between her thumb and index finger, traveling all the way to her pinky in wide arcs. Then it returned to its former position the same way, almost like someone had rewound its tape. Well, it's not like everyone always sees the same things anyway. I furrowed my brows, unable to understand what Nadasaki meant. When I was a kid, I told a friend that a flower she drew in arts class had weird colors. But my friend thought those colors were beautiful. Her flower mainly used rich colors like red, blue, and purple. But for whatever reason, she used achromatic colors like brown and gray to color a few parts of it. It honestly looked pretty creepy to me. But to my friend, who liked the possessed a different interpretation of colors, it looked very charming. Nadasaki looked around and pointed at a decorative strawberry on her table. For example, we can both agree that the strawberry is red. However, there's no way to tell if the red you and I see are the same. There's no way to express such a difference in words, and it causes no misunderstandings either. I think you're losing me. Huh? Really? <laughs> Red. I returned home, took a shower, and ate yesterday's potato salad leftovers for dinner. Then I slumped down into the sofa and began watching TV. The news commentator kept babbling on about unrelated things instead of introducing the actual news. Been there. I kept absentmindedly staring at the screen, and as I hadn't really paid attention to all the details of what happened and why... I realized I only remembered the opinion of the expert they brought in. I began my search for a less tiring program, and after a bit of flipping through channels, settled on the weather broadcast. I thought about my time in the clinic. Nadasaki told me she needed some preparation for the hypnotherapy, and I was sent home right after the explanation of my test results. Give it some thought before our next appointment. According to Nadasaki, I'd forgotten the very thing that caused me to hallucinate. Both that and my memory loss was apparently some sort of self-defense mechanism against mental trauma. Got it. Takako's disappearance was so shocking, it made me forget how it even happened. If the hallucinations were simply caused by not having Takako in my life anymore, time could easily solve the issue. Still, shock and stress being the cause just didn't sound right to me. Takako was the most important person in my life. I'd do anything if there was a way to make her come back. But neither she nor I could have wished for nonsense like this. <clears throat> As I returned to the clinic, I found Nadasaki staring at her notepad. What are you reading? She gave me a glance and said, It's a record of some of my old patients. 
As I sat down, Nadasaki closed her notebook and stuffed it into a drawer. You said my hallucinations were special, but how do people normally start seeing them? Nadasaki answered with an aloof, hmm. Many hypotheses exist that pertain to hallucinations, but there's still a lot we don't know. The most accepted one is the dopamine hypothesis. Your nervous cells secrete too much dopamine in the syn synapses, and it makes the electrical impulses in your brain go haywire, showing you hallucinations. There's another hypothesis that hallucinations occur when your self-awareness drops. When you wake up in the morning, sometimes there's a short period where you don't remember who you are, right? It's something like that, basically. The hypothesis states that you lose the ability to differentiate between things happening in reality and things inside your head. Well, those are the most common cases, anyway. How do you treat them? In both cases, you've got to do away with the cause first. There are many things that can cause dopamine access, but in most cases, it's induced by drugs. Most of the time, you can take care of that by simply taking medicine with dopamine antagonists. As for the drop of self-awareness, it's usually the result of stress after a strong mental trauma. In that case, you first have to elucidate the concrete cause and solve it for the patient. Hmm. Sounds pretty complicated. Don't worry about it. Your case is different. And besides, you can leave all the complicated stuff to me. Nadasaki gave me a smile. I wonder if determining the cause will also make my hallucinations disappear. Everything has a cause and a reason. We'll start from clarifying those. Everything had a reason. It was something I'd heard Narasaki say before. Actually, I think I'd heard her say something along those lines multiple times. And I agreed with the idea. I think my symptoms have a reason, too. I told Narasaki what I'd been thinking about since last night. I think... I think... I've mistaken the date of Takako's disappearance to make sense of why they'd both be in the office at the same time. That has to be it. But I'm still not sure why my hallucinations happened in the first place. Even if her disappearance was an incredible shock to me, I doubt I'd want to deceive myself just so I wouldn't have to face it. I just wouldn't do something like that. So I want to remember what really happened and figure this thing out properly. Nadasaki nodded. You might end up remembering something unpleasant, though. I tried imagining what it could possibly be, but nothing came to mind. Putting that aside, though, I was more scared of living my life seeing things that weren't real. If it's related to Takako, I can't allow myself to just forget it. Whatever this is, it better not be graphic. Don't do this. Don't do that to me. Nadasaki picked up the 5 yen coin from the desk. Are you really going to use that? Nadasaki made a silent smile as she attached a piece of string to the coin. I'll use hypnosis to bring out memories from your subconsciousness to the surface. However, there's no guarantee they'll be real memories. There were cases when a hypno hypnotized patient started talking about being kidnapped by aliens or their memories from a previous life. The brain has a hard time differentiating between real memories and illusions. So, if something like that happens, what are we going to do? I'll ask you questions, and I'll try my best to lead you to the answers we need while you're in an unconscious state. So, it's all up to you, basically? Yep. Don't worry, I'm actually pretty good at this. Are you ready? I am. I sat down in the cozy armchair, almost lying down. Nadasaki came closer and told me to relax. Then she told me to watch the coin. As I started, as it started to slowly sway, she began to talk. Try remembering that trip. I focused my thoughts on the last trip I had with Takako. A street paved with stones, brick buildings around me. Takako and I are walking together. Street paved with stones, brick buildings around me. Takako and I are walking together. 
I felt the nostalgic scent of a town I visited a long, long time ago. I was walking behind Takako, who kept looking left and right. I could hear the cool sound of running water as we continued down the stone paved street, surrounded by tall stone buildings. At the end of the alley, we found ourselves in a small square at the very center of the old town. There was a giant fountain there. Marble sculptures lined the wall behind the fountain with all sorts of engravings on its edge. In the center stood the ruler of the seas, Neptune, surrounded on each side by the fertility goddess Ceres and the goddess of help, Salus. Water flowed forth from the legs of all three, trickling down to the huge puddle below them like a waterfall. Takako already had two coins in her hand. I hope I don't miss. Is it even possible with such a huge target? Just try not to hit anyone like you did at Asakusa. The small square, half of which had been taken up by the fountain, was filled with people. A group of workers pulling a cart packed with large boxes. People resting on the stairs, a couple sitting on the stone handrail, seemingly more interested in each other than the fountain, and a group of tourists listening to the explanations of their guide. Takako turned her back to the fountain and tossed the coin backwards. The coin, painting a beautiful arc against the blue of the sky, plopped into the water, vanishing from sight. Did I get it in? As I nodded, Takako's face lit up. After taking a handful of pictures in front of the fountain, I grabbed Takako, still reluctant to leave, by the arm and left the square. Where are we going next? Hmm... As we entered the alley neighboring a gelato shop, Takako placed the camera back into her bag and pulled out the tourist booklet we bought at the airport, spreading the map that she kept inside it. Then she checked the compass key holder that was attached to her bag. The main attraction today is obviously the cathedral, which is here. And we're here. Which means we gotta go there. Takako showed me the map and pointed at the alley to the west. You're interested in churches and cathedrals, right? Hmm. Don't know which one of them is talking. After checking out this temple in that square, we can cross the river and head for the Grand Cathedral. Takako pointed out the pictures in the booklet as we walked. Hmm. I heard a rattling sound from behind the corner next to the shoe store. Whoa! Takako jumped out of the way of a yellow tricycle that suddenly appeared. The tricycle, its cargo box filled with red and pink flowers, creaked as though expressing some sort of discontent, then swiftly disappeared beyond another corner, leaving only a faint fragrance of flowers in its wake. It smells nice, Takako remarked. There were many stores in the arc-shaped alleyway, their display windows filled with a plethora of things. A wine store had a bunch of wooden boxes with bottles stacked in front of it. A confectionery had two transparent bags of colorful beans hanging above its doors. Its orange-tinted display window was packed with three rows of various chocolates and candies shaped in the forms of flowers and fruits. Sachi, let's hurry on to the temple! Takako, who had gotten ahead of me as I briefly halted to look at the candies, came back and clasped my hand. You're not embarrassed to hold hands? Everyone's doing it here. Remember that couple at the fountain? Those two are glued to each other. She pulled on my hand. Besides, we already went on a trip together. What's there to be embarrassed about? Takako let out an audible laugh. As we exited the alleyway, we found ourselves in another square with a fountain. So I guess they're in Greece? It was surrounded by people who looked like street performers and souvenir shops that seemed to specialize in wood carving. They're either in Greece or Italy, okay? Turning to the right, I spotted a huge white pillar. As we continued down the bustling square while clasping each other's hands, another set of pillars appeared from the shadow of the one we saw from the distance. Wow, it's huge! The triangle-shaped roof of the temple was supported by 16 big white stone pillars. 
Under it, there was a long entrance with a tall ceiling that was shaped like a cylindrical dome from the outside. It's okay to go inside, right? I want to see how it looks. Takako pulled my hand towards the entrance, nimbly evading the people in the crowd. I looked up at the dome above our heads. Unlike the entrance, there were no pillars supporting it, and I could see the blue sky peeking out from the hole in its center. After admiring the divine-looking pillar of light, we continued toward the morning market that was mentioned in the booklet. Okay, this is, this is Italy. I recognize that flag. There were no big roads that led to it, so we had to use all t all, lots of tiny alleyways between buildings. Despite getting lost a few times, we finally found our way to our destination. However, being exhausted by the long trek, we decided to first take a break at a nearby restaurant. What kind of flower do you think that is? Which one? We gazed at the market from under the white parasols leaning, lining the restaurant's terrace. There were countless wooden stands next to each other. Every single one sported canvas roofs to protect them from the sun. Their assortment included food, spices, fruits, flowers, and other miscellaneous goods. There's a blue bucket with purple flowers near that stand. I'm not sure what they are. They look kind of like chrysanthemums, though. I wonder if we have them in Japan. Remember that vegetable sword from earlier? It was pretty awesome. Who would have thought there'd be so many different species of tomatoes? I wonder if they use different ones for different dishes. As we were discussing the market, the waiter approached us to take our order. You gonna order salad again? Yeah, or you gonna order salad again? Yes. As Takaku spoke with the waiter, all the while gesturing like a crazy person, I glanced back at the market one more time. Looks like a festival! It's nice to see everyone running around and back and forth with so much energy. I wonder if it's like that every day. Takako said that as she finished conveying our orders. Seems like the square has served a variety of different purposes over the years. At one point, it was a field of flowers. In another period, it was used to stage executions. Or her. I told her what was written on the building. Executions? You know, like flogging. I wonder if the people who came here to pick flowers ever imagined the place would end up like that. Uh, Italy? No, haven't been there yet. I will one day. I need to have authentic pizza and pasta in Rome. It needs to happen. As a lover of pizza and pasta. <laughs> or if the people who are flogged here expected this area to eventually become a market. I'm not sure how that matters in any way. Takako shook her head, wolfing down the fruit she bought at the market. Like, try imagining someone in the distant past sitting in the same place as we do. What if that someone imagined that there would be a restaurant here, and that a woman sitting there would be thinking about them? Wouldn't that be incredible? Hmm. It would have been pretty miraculous for them to imagine that some Asian girl would one day be bringing it up to her girlfriend while chewing on fruits. I'm willing to bet it's about as likely as the birth of another universe or something. Really? Or rather, even less likely than that. Takako stuffed a piece of orange in her mouth and closed her eyes. Alright. Now I'm thinking about two homosexual aliens from Jupiter having a picnic here after the fall of humanity and thinking about two Asian women eating fruits at a restaurant in the very same place while they themselves snack on seaweed-filled rice balls. If you skip the homosexual bit in rice balls, you might even be right. You think it'd be as likely as the birth of a new universe? That would be nice. I hope someone builds a temple for us, too, if that happens. Yeah, right. I think the possibility of the current gods punishing you for these ideas is a lot higher, actually. Friendly banter. <clears throat> we stopped in front of a panini sandwich cart that stood at the middle of a stone bridge across the river. 
It resembled a giant opened up umbrella with gelato, soft drinks, and all sorts of snacks lined up under it. We bought some panini and drinks and continued down the road. I still can't get used to how cheap everything is here. Takako remarked as she gobbled down her panini. <laughs> She's going to put on weight as she keeps buying stuff. Her sandwich was shaped like a cream puff with cheese. Prosciutto, ham, and rucola, rucola herbs. Wow, I do not know those words. Unable to watch Takako try and fail to fit it into her mouth, the store clerk helped her crush the thing into a smaller size. You want a taste? Noticing my stare, Takako offered a bite of her sandwich. I nodded and helped myself to a small portion. The bread had just the right amount of crispness to it, while the savory smell coming from inside it, combined with the taste of ham and cheese, resulted in a truly mouth-watering culinary experience. Kind of surprised you can get something this good at that price. The restaurant we had lunch at was pretty cheap too. I wonder if it's their economy. Could be. I answered her as I wolfed the food down. Then I took a sip of the Coke we bought at the same store. We could save money, quit our jobs in Japan, and move here. Takako crossed the river and entered another alleyway. That's one plan for the far future. Then maybe we should move here earlier and run a shop together, like the one we just been to. You mean a cart? They had flower carts in San Francisco, too. Yeah, you see them a lot overseas. I guess it's cheaper than renting out an actual building. I wonder what they do on days with bad weather. With no air conditioning, I doubt business is booming during winter. On top of that, if the wheels of the carts get damaged or something, you can't sell anything until you get them fixed. Yeah, I wonder how they profit. There's no way to know unless we have the data, but given the amount of them in this town, it can't be that bad. I imagine you can insure the cart, too. I see. If you're so curious, how about asking them directly? I pointed out another cart shop at the road by the river. It seemed to be dealing in women's apparel and had all sorts of clothes hung up that blocked the view. Still, I could at least spot a female customer talking with a white-haired middle-aged clerk. Takako looked at the cart for a while before turning back to me. It would be cool to travel all around the world selling your things, but I'd rather have a proper store so I can design it the way I want. I'm sure that bothers you more than profits. Of course! In either case, we'd have to study the native language here. Yep. Let's do it together, just like we did with English! I wonder if they have any movies in this language. I'm sure they do. The sun peeked out from between the buildings surrounding the alley, making Takako narrow her eyes. The edges of the brown-colored roofs cast many uneven shadows on the road. Ah, oh, that arch looks pretty cute. Or, that arch looks pretty cute. I followed Takako's finger to see a grated window with an angel carved in the arch above it. The wall was covered in green ivy, so it gave the impression that the angel was peeking out of the forest. I wonder if some ancient artisan made it. I imagine that's the case. It's kind of cool to have so many old things remain in your town, don't you think? I bet if we moved here, we could also pretend we were living in the Middle Ages. That's all good and fine, but we should think about that after we finish paying off our loan for a ten-story apartment complex built with reinforced concrete. Those buildings look like they're made from stone. Could they be like 2,000 years old or something? Takako furrowed her brows. Maybe. Makes you think of the three little pigs, doesn't it? I like cozy wooden buildings. Would you prefer to live up north then? Apparently the northern region of this place was affected by the architecture of neighboring countries, so they got in a lot of wooden buildings there. It's written in the booklet. Here. She pointed at the picture of some mountain village. Hmm. Then you can come, then you can make homemade panini for me. Sure, but you're making the ham. What? The ham's gonna be homemade too? Takako shrugged. We continued down the road, our shoes clicking against the mosaic laden pavement. 
Is this where it happens? It's that roof, right? Should be, but it doesn't feel like we're getting any closer. We can see the bluish roof of the Grand Cathedral towering above the other tech buildings in the distance. Long houses with no gaps in between them littered the streets, which made it impossible to take a straight path to any one direction. It felt like we kept wandering around in circles for the last 30 minutes without ever getting closer to that roof at all. We lost sight of the roof completely after a bunch of buildings with brown roofs blocked it from view. Siesta time must have begun, considering there were only a few people wandering the streets. The rest were probably taking a break or napping. Hmm. As I was examining a window with sturdy-looking Venetian shutters, a tourist carriage pulled by a horse passed by us. I'll go ask! Wait here! Takako darted after the carriage, disappearing into one of the small alleys. I hurried after her, but by the time I turned the corner, neither Takako nor the carriage were anywhere in sight. I bet she got lost like a dunce. After checking my watch and realizing it had been five minutes since Takako disappeared, I decided there was no point waiting any longer. I continued down the coiling stone road, using the roof of the Grand Cathedral as my landmark. I also made sure to check the booklet each time I found a significant-looking gothic-style building or fountain. The booklet's pages seemed a lot darker than before. I looked up and saw that the sun had moved to an angle where the building surrounding me almost completely blocked it from sight. I glanced behind me, noticing that both the road I came from and the direction I was heading in were completely devoid of people. I continued down a road full of shops with closed shutters and darkened display windows. Quickening my pace, I began to draw closer to another corner. However, right before I could make the turn, a person emerged from behind it and bumped into me. Oh, Susie! I'm sorry. Hmm? You're Japanese? Oh, or, you're Japanese? Wait, this isn't, this isn't her. Is it? I can't tell if this is Sachi or not. I don't think it is. Looks very similar, though. I looked up and saw a long-haired woman with a spirited look in her eyes. Her gaze traveled from my face to the booklet in my hands. Are you lost? She asked. These backfield streets are full of twisty turns and dead ends. It's kind of it's kind of easy to get lost. I could show you the way out if you want. She gave me a friendly look. After I accepted her offer, she introduced herself as Fujisaka Nanai. She walked a short distance ahead of me, her heels confidently clicking against the stone pavement like it was her own backyard. You're trying to get to the Grand Cathedral, right? She's probably heading that way too. What if you can't find her there? I'll go back to the hotel. That's probably for the best, yeah. Thanks. You're a lifesaver. Hey, don't sweat it. Even I was getting a bit anxious walking around on my own. I couldn't spot much anxiety in the confident smile she gave me. Most of the stores and government offices close around this time, and the place turns into a ghost town. In exchange, they stay up late and get up early. Being from Japan, I still don't quite get how their economy can function like that. Fujisaka kept bringing up all sorts of subjects, most likely trying to find something that would help inside a conversation. I suppose the siesta system won't stay around if it starts seriously hindering their economy, though. Yeah. Yeah, and even then, all the Japanese will be shocked to hear that on the news. That it was a thing to begin with. Yeah, exactly. I kept answering the questions she brought up as we walked. I myself tried answering a thing or two. Fujisaka came from the... Kansai region and was a year older than me. You were in kindergarten together? That's pretty incredible. Is it? Don't you have anyone like that, Miss Fujisaka? I was brought up in a mountain town in the middle of nowhere. I had a few friends like that until middle school, but they all eventually left to live in cities. Can't blame them for wanting to get out. Fujisaka spoke as she continued to lead me ahead. Hmm... What do you do for a living, Miss Muzino? Mizuno? 
I run a design company. Only founded it recently, though. You got your own company? That's pretty incredible. What exactly do design companies do, anyway? We design logos for other companies, advertising posters, packages for all sorts of goods, and so on. We deal in anything as long as it falls under designing and doesn't exceed what our capabilities allow for. Did you come here for a commission, too? Not really. I just like traveling. I see. Are you also traveling, Miss Fujisaka? You seem to be used to this area. I came here to buy furniture. You know, like couches, tables, and so on. Do you run a furniture store? Fujisaka shook her head without looking back at me. Nah, I run an inn back home. It's a western mansion that's been around since before the war, so a lot of our things are old and need to be replaced. That said, we can't afford to replace everything with expensive modern furniture, so I come here once in a while looking for materials to fix some of our old stuff, plus cheaper replacements for the things that are too old to do anything about. Can't you buy those in Japan? You can, but it's expensive. Besides, I also like traveling. Fujisaka, who was slightly taller than me, shot a brief glance my way and continued walking forward. Where's this town of yours in Kansai, exactly? It's in Hyogo. Want to come visit us sometime? It's an ancient place, but you seem like the type who likes that kind of stuff. <clears throat> yes, it sounds pretty interesting. Fujisaka pulled out a notebook from her jeans pocket and wrote down her address and contact information. I don't have a business card. Maybe it's about time I made one. She tore out a page from her notebook and handed it to me. In that case, I might visit you one of my, during one of my business trips. Sachi should still have that! If that was actually a thing that happened, she should still have that. We continued down a street decorated with flower reliefs, and after passing through another narrow hallway, alleyway, found ourselves in front of a huge cathedral. Here we are! The silence that followed us through the long alleyways was instantly dispelled by the clamor of the tourists. This was by far the biggest square I'd seen, made even more overwhelming by the Grand Cathedral looming above it. This is the Central Park, said Fujisaka. A sun clock towered in the center of the stone-paved square, with a set of tall stone pillars surrounding it in a cylindrical arrangement. I wonder if your friend is here. I glanced around in all directions one more time, but to no avail. Takako was nowhere to be seen. I can't see her anywhere. Let's check out the inside of the cathedral. <clears throat> Fujisaka started toward the giant dome. From up close, the Grand the Cathedral was so overwhelming it felt almost like it could fall over and crush you. We ascended the stairs, drawing closer to the entrance, supported by eight cylindrical and four rectangular columns. As I passed by them, I suddenly saw a pair of green twin tails dance in the air. They disappeared behind the humongous gates. Found her! Just as I was about to hurry after Takako, Fujisaka suddenly stopped. I guess this is goodbye then. I can't go into the cathedral dressed like this. She placed her palm on one of her sleeveless shoulders. I'd like to thank you somehow. I'd like to thank you somehow later. You're only going to end up having to go through another adventure to find me. Rather than that, I think you should just enjoy the rest of your trip with your friend. Thank you very much. I don't know what I would have done without you. No prob. Anyway, you should probably hurry. I thanked Fujisaka and passed through the gates in pursuit of Takako. I took a quick glance back and saw Fujisaka waving me goodbye. If that temple we saw earlier followed a simple is best kind of philosophy, then this one seemed closer to gorgeous is best. Various colorful and fantastical pictures decorated the walls. Everything from the pillars to even the handrails had some sort of carving on them. The pillar of light descending from the ceiling illuminated both the statues of angels as well as the painting of heaven on the walls. Not letting my eyes linger on one spot for too long, I looked around for Takako, finally spotting her ascending the stairs under the huge tectorium. 
I followed after her, making my way up the spiral staircase. As I reached the veranda on the upper side of the Tectorium, I descended another small set of stairs leading further up. <clears throat> After going up another dark spiral staircase with no windows, I suddenly had to stop and narrow my eyes at the light coming from outside. The wind blew past my ears as I reached the outside of the Tectorium. Opening my eyes, I was met by a vast rust-colored cityscape stretching before me. I looked down at the Central Park and the various alleyways that Fujisaka and I traversed earlier. Sachi! As I looked over that breathtaking sight, all the while struggling to hold my hair in place against the fierce wind, I heard Takako's voice from nearby. I was looking for you, Sachi. Takako, her expression colored by surprise, made her way through some people in the narrow passage and approached me. Is she really here? Before she could hug me, I squeezed her cheeks between my palms. And just where did you go? I kind of got disoriented after losing that carriage. Okay, she's real. And then... I spotted this blue bird and started following it. Before I knew it, I was in the square. What are you? M middle? Did the sight of an ancient town make your brain leap into a fantasy world? I heaved a long sigh. How'd you know I'd be here? Well, you do love high places. We know each other so well, we don't even need words. I flicked her on the forehead. At least we have the common decency to realize when I'm calling you an idiot. Before long, the orange of dust completely overtook the blue sky. Well, this is... this is a pretty sunset. The town below us seemed to have regained its life as people slowly began to fill the formerly deserted squares and alleyways. All's well that ends well. Takako scratched her belly. The darkening orange of the setting sun gradually painted the brown walls and tiles a deep hue of red. Although the buildings seemed to be lined up haphazardly below us, creating nothing short of a maze, all their windows were perfectly designed to be on the same height. It felt as though they were forming a giant tree with numerous branches extending across the town. After looking around the Grand Cathedral and enjoying the nighttime streets for a while, we returned to the hotel. Can I save right here? I will save right here. I don't know. I feel like this is a good saving point. Save again just to be sure. This seems like a good save point to me. I don't know what to expect going forward. And I feel like we just went through a lot. And I'm very afraid of what might happen next. <laughs> I thought, like, this game... Ugh, it's doing the fake outs, man. And I know it's doing it on purpose. It's like, oh, something's bad. something bad is going to happen to her. Oh no, no, she just disappeared. Oh no, she didn't disappear. Here she is, all's well. It's like, so something bad is going to happen to her. Like, oh man, what's going to happen? <sighs> Let's continue next week and see if we can figure it out. <laughs> so that was Seabed. <laughs> it's just a chill vacationing. Don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was Seabed. <laughs> I'll be continuing it next Sunday. Thanks, Buster, for being here. I'll be back on Tuesday and Friday to play something else. Um, and as an aside, I will be in... What you call? I will be in Las Vegas the week after next, so there will be a short intermission um, in, between, in between those. But next week I'll be back, and that's what matters most. On behalf of East Asia Soft, I have been Skull. Have yourselves a great day and a great week, and I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.